Welcome to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. In-depth conversations and opinion covering a variety of topics from the world of news, sports, and more. Here's Mike McFeely. Welcome to another episode of the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. And we have a first-time guest on the pod today. Uh, If you read the forum and have read the forum for, oh, about the last... 40 years or so, you'll recognize the name. He's blushing now. Um, You'll recognize the name. He is Pat Springer. He is a reporter, a longtime reporter uh, for the Forum who has worn many hats and covered many beats over the course of his career here. But we're going to talk today about a story that he has been all over for, gosh, it's been a couple of years, Pat? Yes, a little more and than two years. Welcome to the podcast, by the way. Thanks for doing this, by the way. <laughs> oh, so, thanks. Happy to be here. So, it's been. We're talking about the. We're going to talk about the wild horses at Theodore Roosevelt National Park in West North Dakota, and all the twists and turns that that has taken. But that, it's been a couple of years that this has been yes. stewing, right? Yes. These horses. Um, fate was. Um, in doubt for a little more than two years when on April 25th, the Park Service announced, um, Senator John Hoven announced that they had backed away from plans to remove the the herd of wild horses that have roamed the, the south unit of the park really since at least the park was established in 1947. But these horses have been documented in that that area going back to at least the open range era of Theodore Roosevelt's time back in the 1880s. And, um, but the, uh, the Park Service embarked on a plan, um, started about two years ago, and uh, frankly, Senator Hoven just called it a removal process. Theoretically, they, they had a number of possible fates for the horses. They, they could just be kept as they are now, um, or they could have just a small demonstration herd in a corral, or they could get rid of them quickly, or they could get rid of them slowly. And really, they seemed hell-bent to get rid of these horses. But there was a tremendous public backlash, and the uh, North Dakota legislature unanimously passed a resolution urging them to keep the horses. The entire congressional delegation weighed in, saying keep the horses. All of the tribes the uh, issued mm-hmm. statements, resolutions, urging them to keep the horses. You know, Mike, in, in all my years here, I have never seen any issue that has had such a unanimity of, of agreement. Yeah, you know, right. it's hard to find a person who said, yeah, get rid of those darn horses. Most people love the horses. It's a big part of going to the park for many people. And they've just been a fixture of the park. And even the park's own surveys show that they're immensely popular by visitors. So it's really been kind of a mystery as to why they have been, you know, so determined to get rid of the horses. And they've never really given a forthright reason. What they have said is is that, uh, well, they do not regard horses as a native species. We could have an interesting conversation Mm -hmm. about that. We can explore that a little bit. They do not uh, view the horses as a native species, so they are not in the same class as bison, elk, pronghorn, even prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are native species, so they belong there in the views, in the eyes of the park uh, service. Um, and really, since the park was established in 1947, it's, it's kind of an interesting story. They, they established Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Park in 1947, and then in the 1950s, in preparation for reintroducing bison, they built a perimeter fence uh, for the south unit, and really inadvertently wound up fencing in a bunch of horses. And in those days, a lot of nearby ranchers just let their livestock, especially horses, graze there. And um, it had been public land, much of it, before it became the park. And so they, they, they found themselves with a bunch of, of horses, including wild horses. And so they had a big, big um, old-style Western roundup in 1954. It was quite the, uh, quite the show. Um, and they got most of the horses, and the overwhelming majority of those horses that they succeeded in rounding up were, were branded stock. They were, hmm. they were trespass okay. stock. But they didn't get the, uh, the wild horses. And... Um, uh, so um, it's it's been a long story, but but really, um, so from 1947 until around 1970, the official policy of the park was, we don't think these horses belong. We want to get rid of them. And then a superintendent came along in 1970. I think maybe he was reading that Theodore Roosevelt himself had um, remarked about commonly seeing wild horses in the area. Well, and, and, that, 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 and that's where I want to go. Just so let me interrupt, interrupt yes. you there. So I think it's important to point out that it's believed. 
that the wild horses in that are now in Theodore Roosevelt National Park park descend from a time when you know Theodore Roosevelt himself was in that area and possibly before that I know that some of the Native American tribes in North Dakota have said that they believe it's that some of the horses might be descendants of sitting bulls horses I believe I read in one of your stories as well yes and so when we talk about the the National Park Service treating horses as what I would call invasive species, which is a sort of a trigger word for bad things now, an invasive species. Yeah, maybe long term, but these horses are not, they just didn't show up in the park five right. years ago. They've right. been there for more than 100 yeah. years and long before it was ever Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Exactly. They're, they're hardly uh, newcomers. Um, yes, you know, I think many people view these horses as, as living history. And really, I think you can trace back the lineage to to um, basically two uh, strains, um, Indian ponies and and ranch stock that that got loose, and um, you know I've I've read that um, uh, back during the uh, deadly smallpox epidemics of the uh, 1700s 1800s, it killed off many of the Mandan Hadatsa and Arikara, and they had been major horse traders. The Hadatsas, mm. you know, we, we know about their Knife River um, villages, mm-hmm. and they were quite the trade hub. And and among the things that you traded there were, were horses. But anyway, people got very very sick. Many people died. And the horse, you know, lots of horses got loose during that time. So, gosh, you know, these horses could go back to at least that time. We, we just don't wow. know. But wild horses have been running around North Dakota for, for a long, a long time. And then, of course, you have ranch stock and um, they would get loose sometimes. This was the open range. You did not yep. have fences. And, you know, there's a great story about Theodore Roosevelt. Some, some of your listeners might know this story that um, he was in uh, what was once called Mingusville, Montana, which is now we. Montana. What a great name, by the way. It Mingusville. is Mingusville. Yeah, yeah. They didn't. <laughs> anyway, he uh, he went into a bar and he wound up be- being confronted by a bully, and Roosevelt actually punched this bully oh. and knocked him out. And um, But often forgotten is, you know, why was uh, Theodore Roosevelt in Mingusville? He was looking for lost horses. Oh. And um, now you mentioned a moment ago Sitting Bull. And, and indeed, when, um, you know, Sitting Bull, after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, um, he was one of the recalcitrants. He just did not want to go to the reservation. And um, uh, so he wound up with a bunch of followers uh, fleeing up to Canada, and he spent about five years up in Canada, and uh, he had actually at one point four thousand followers. But at the end, he was with about two hundred people who who turned themselves in after the buffalo had disappeared almost from Canada. They were they were basically starving to death. They they just had to no no real alternative but to surrender. And once they surrendered at Fort Buford in eighteen eighty one, they also had to hand over their their firearms and their horses. And then um, a guy that. Uh, so these uh, some post traders at auction wound up buying about 300, 350 horses, these Indian ponies. Um, and um, the Marquis de Demore, Mores mm-hmm. wound up buying uh, many of these horses. And he, um, he had been a French cavalry officer, and he was quite a horse fancier himself. And... Um, he planned on, on having a big forest ranch. Well, that never panned out. Of course, after his stagecoach line and his slaughterhouse went belly up, he, he left the Badlands. And another wealthy guy named Arthur Clark, Clark Heidekoper wound up buying these horses. And he wound up having a huge, huge horse ranch in the southern Badlands. And he bred them with, with European breeds. He called it the, uh, the American horse. And this was kind of the precursor of what is today called the Nakota horse, which is a horse that originated in in the park. So um, anyway, I think of the Badlands as an equine melting pot where where horses that got loose from ranches, from from Indian herds, just hung out there. And, you know, there's actually quite good grass there. There's obviously shelter. You've got springs. You've Mm -hmm. got the Little Missouri River. Um, It's a great place for wild horses. It's a great place to be a horse. (laughs) Yes, yes. Sounds inviting. (laughs) So... And again, to go back a little bit and, and backtrack on something you said earlier, it Theodore Roosevelt National Park became set aside, if you will, and became a park in 1947. And you said it was shortly after that that then they tried to, they fenced in the park, which 
I mean, this isn't like putting a fence around your backyard. This is, you know, hundred or hundreds of miles of of fencing that ended up keeping the horses in. But the Park Service's stance from that time until 1970 was that they wanted to get rid of those horses even from then, during that time. So the the, the, yes. pu- the push to eliminate horses from the park is not a new thing. Not by any means. Now, this is all very well documented um, in a report that uh, a researcher named Castle McLaughlin wrote in 1989. She had actually been a Park Service employee, and she was a lifelong horsewoman. And so she proposed a, a study of the origins and the history of the horses. And... Um, she got some funding to do that. And so she is, is the person who I think first made the connection to, you know, there is a well-documented lineage that has the sitting bull ponies going from Fort Buford to the, uh, the HT mm-hmm. Heide Copa Ranch. And, and um, she talked to a bunch of the old ranchers in the area, and she also had access to park records. So she really laid out a, a lot of this, this history and um, the, the really kind of antagonistic stance of the park toward the horses. Even at a time, ironically enough, that when the park was first established in 1947, it was again called the Theodore Roosevelt Memorial Park, and its mission was to memorialize Theodore Roosevelt and the, the open range ranching and, era. And his time in North Dakota. Of, of yes. Course. Theodore yes, Roosevelt, who yes. was the president and, at one time later in his life, spent an important part of his life in western North Dakota, which he later referred to as, I could have never been president were it not for my time I, I spent in North Dakota. Yes. A speech he made in Fargo in 1910, by the way. Oh, nice. Um, anyway, yes. And, um, um, of course, horses were integral to ranching. You, you, you couldn't raise cattle without horses. And um, so... Uh, yeah, that was that was kind of ironic. Um, and again, the uh, a superintendent came along in 1970 and changed that. And they decided, in as of 1970, to keep a um, what they called a demonstration herd to depict, you know, the the open range era. And so, really, ever since they've um, yes, kind of grudgingly allowed yeah, sort for of, these sort horses of, uh, to to all. Yeah, and don't really, um, we, we don't like it necessarily, and it, maybe it shouldn't be this way. But well, we're going to find a way to to yes, compromise and, and make it work. I, I think it's important to note here that you know the the Park Service. Um, oh, I guess there are about a thousand um, wild horses in in a, maybe half a dozen federal parks. Um, around the country. The largest by far is, is this herd mm-hmm. uh, of about 200 horses as of recently. And um, But, you know, they've never had a horse specialist at the park. They don't have anybody, frankly, who knows anything about horses, who knows about the importance of maintaining band structure, who's, who's concerned about uh, maintaining a, uh, a genetically healthy, viable herd. Because um, inbreeding, you know, it's a captive population. Mm-hmm. Inbreeding has long been a concern there. And um, um, the uh, the Park Service in 1978 invited a, a range specialist from the Bureau of Land Management, which it manages these western um, uh, federal herds. And he came in and he said that this is excellent horse range, horse pasture. You could have a lot of horses here. And and yet in, in, in an environmental assessment that was done in 1978, um, which... Believe it or not, you know, half a century later, it's 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 referred to as the management document for the the horse herd, and this environmental assessment in 1978 set a goal of maintaining a herd of from 35 to 60 horses. Now, it never ever explained why 35 or 60 horses. It, it provided no justification for that. It was a number that was pulled uh, it, out it, of the air. Apparently. It seems to have been pulled out of the air. And yet that is, you know, the, the park superintendent, Angie Richmond, um, has said that, you know, if we wind up keeping the horses, we would revert back to the 1978 plan. Now, again, not a management plan, an environmental assessment, and as part of which they had invited a BLM range specialist, and that's attached to the report. And it's just all about what a great range this is, and the horses aren't really doing any any more damage mm-hmm. than any other grazing animal. They're, they're fine. So, 
And then uh, another guy came along in the early in the 1990s, and he was consulting with uh, an equine geneticist, Gus Cawthron, and he decided that you know we should have at least 140 horses out there to maintain a genetically healthy herd. And frankly, I don't know that it's been written down, but that's kind of the way they've managed them ever since. Now we all understand that they cannot have a runaway population; that they have to thin their herd, and they've done this over time. Um, back in the old days, they would do this with with riders and helicopter roundups, and they had some problems. It was traumatic for the horses. You, you would have horses die, either you know running themselves to exhaustion trying to escape these he- helicopters, or then when they would be held in livestock um, pens and Dickinson, they would they would be desperate to escape and sometimes injure themselves. Oh. And I think it, uh, you know, and I, I've written about all of this stuff, uh-huh. and and Castle McLaughlin again documented uh, all of this stuff, and um, she's the one who first wrote about this and we we owe her a, a debt because she she captured a lot of this and um but the the park service i think it's fair to say was quite callous and didn't really care very much about these horses as in fact some of these horses um they would sometimes shoot stallions um because they they wanted to get the wildness out of the herd they brought in some domestic um stallions to try to um i guess the theory was to make them more attractive because when they do have to uh, round up and 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 try to sell horses they would they would you know presumably find more ready buyers if you breed it with a a quarter horse or something like that and um some of these horses um ended up as um cat food for the large exotic cats at the old gold seal zoo that you had in medora in the 60s and early 70s so it's it's a really sad and sobering story um, of what has you know been done to these horses over the decades at, at the hands of the National Park Service. So it was clearly something that was sort of simmering there for a long time and people who were really into the park and, and into what was going on knew what was going on. But a couple of years ago then things sort of became more out front and it seemed like the Park Service got more aggressive in wanting to just say, we just want to apparently get rid of the horses. So wh- why did that happen? You know, when did that happen? Was there a reason that happened? And I think maybe that's what you were re- referring to earlier, is I don't know that we know any of this, but, but what happened a couple of years ago that all of a sudden the Park Service said, we have to get rid of these horses. Right. Well, it does remain a mystery. I wish I could answer that question um, with um, some certainty. And um, I, I've asked that question myself many times, and I've, so many of our readers have asked that question. Um, all we know is that in 2022, um, in, a, in a great surprise, the uh, Park Service announced that it was time to um, develop a new plan for the horses, and they called it a livestock management plan. So suddenly, these horses were considered livestock, a word that the Park Service had never used to describe these horses before. Because let's understand, you know, they, now they have been called feral horses, so domestic horses that, that got loose. Um, but let's understand that, you know, as we've discussed, for more than a century, these horses have lived in the wild. They have been entirely on their own. Any horse that's alive in the park today was born I would say wild, not just feral, but wild. wild. They are not looked out in any way. They don't provide them veterinary care. They don't put hay out for them. They are totally left to fend for themselves. And they have been very hardy, and, and they're survivors. They're, they're doing well out there. But all of a sudden, in 2022, we get this livestock management process um, uh, announcement. And at the outset, they had about five possible options. And, and again, these ran the gamut. And um, and then they had a couple of what they called public engagement meetings. Now, this is during the pandemic, so they weren't really public meetings. They were Zoom meetings. And, you know, you couldn't ask any question. Well, you could ask questions, but they chose whatever questions they would answer, and you would never get an opportunity f- for follow-up. So you really couldn't get to the bottom of, of, of anything. And during these public engagement meetings, they did say that they, that um, the, uh, there would be more capacity for other um, grazing animals, if you 
got rid of the horses mm -hmm. and that these other native species could be more resilient, I think was the word they, they used. And I, I don't believe they said so, but I, I think um, people have surmised that they might be concerned about climate change and increasing temperatures and the possibility of prolonged drought and the stress that would put on, on the range. But um, we're just kind of left to, to wonder even today. And I must say, I've, I've many times tried to interview Angie Richmond. She has never granted me an interview. She sometimes responds to my emails. She she doesn't necessarily answer the questions that I put forward to her. She she usually gives just these very general, vague um, questions. Frankly, uh, some of the most in, you know detailed information we're able to get is from Senator Hoven, whose office is in touch with the park. And um, as of April 25th, um, Senator Hoven um, announced and he told me he thought that they had an agreement. And the and Hoven has been quite clear in his public statements that he wants to see a herd that would be. Um, genetically viable. And there's no single magic number there. Uh, I think you would get some a variance of opinion uh, depending upon which you know equine geneticist you might be talking uh, to. But, I, but again, that, that 140 is probably a good base number, around 200. In other words, about the population that we have today, it would be good. Um, and um, uh, Senator Hoven has uh, some cards to play here. He's on the Appropriations Committee, and, and your listeners might recall that during the uh, Appropriations Bill process, he inserted language that um, you know made clear that Congress wanted the horses to stay and in numbers that were commensurate with the, the time of the open range, which in, in Senator Hoven's mind would mean a, a, a good number of mm -hmm. horses that would, again, give you a genetically viable herd. And I think it's important to note that um, while the park stopped doing helicopter roundups, they, among other things, crashed a helicopter. <laughs> and again, they had all these other other problems. So they got away from helicopter roundups, and everybody thought, well, that's great. That's good. And they were going to do what they call low-stress removals, where they just take out a few horses at a time. And all well and good. Um, uh, but also in 2009, they started experimenting with a drug called Gonicon, which is... Um, it prevents the mares from from you know uh, giving birth. It's a from, birth from control drug. It, yes, it's a birth control drug, and um, it had never been used in horses before, and it's a relatively new drug. And so, from 2009 to 2013, a uh, research team from Colorado State University was. Um, researching the, the efficacy of, of Gonicon on the, the park horses. And they found that as of, they, they found a couple of things. One single dose didn't do the trick. But if they were given a booster dose a couple of years later or so, um, that would, you know, provide reliable birth control. So that's, that's good. Oh, except they found out that um, I, I think it was 19 of 24 of these mares that had received booster doses had never again given birth. So they had not, you know, re regained fertility, leaving open the question that at least some of these mares are sterile. So suddenly you've got a pretty significant um, percentage of your mares who might have been rendered sterile. So right away you, you have to ask, well, what does this do to the, the genetic composition mm -hmm. of the herd? You know, you're losing the contributions of a sizable number of mares and you're leaving a smaller pool of, of horses that can reproduce. What is this doing to the genetic viability of the herd? Oh, and by the way, they've also been, you know, removing a lot of these young horses. They don't do it dramatically. They don't announce these things, but they just go and they grab young horses. And I think it's been more than 200. It's it's been a lot of mm. horses, then you know, um, since 2015 or so, and. Um, once again, you know, what is that doing? Well, it, it skews the population. You think of a population profile, you want to see a, a diversity of ages, young, middle, and old. Well, if you're removing a bunch of young horses, mm -hmm. you, are, you are skewing your population profile to be older. And also, you've got some mares that aren't reproducing. So suddenly... What what's going on? And and we don't know. The the, hor the the park does not appear to be studying this. Doesn't appear to be concerned about this. Um, 
and I won't answer any questions about it. And um, there are a lot of people who are very concerned about this and, you know, worried about the long-term viability of this herd, which I think it's fair to say is a beloved herd. Yeah, you know? clearly. And so... Um, so is it, are you suggesting it's purposeful, what the park is doing? Well, I will say that... I. I I, I won't offer an opinion, but I will tell you that advocates who follow this have openly said that they think that the park is trying to accomplish gradually over time what it has been unable to accomplish sure. quickly. That's what I was getting at. Was that, that, it's, if you, you, know, if you I, can't do it immediately, yeah, can you play the long yeah, game? I, I, I don't think that their goal is to eliminate every horse, but I do think that for whatever reason, they want to get it down to 35 to, to 60 horses. And, and um, you know, I, I'm often reminded of a conversation I had, uh, oh, five, six years ago or so with um, Blake McCann, who's the chief resource officer, so in charge of natural resources, including flora and fauna, the horses included. And I was at the time doing a story about how popular these horses were and how they have, you know, like something like a million followers on their fan pages on, on Facebook. Wow. They're, they're, they're just a, fen, a, a phenom. The people who follow these horses, they've, they've all been named and, and, you know, there are about 15 or so bands headed by a dominant stallion and, and, um, so all, all these horses are, are not in one big that's pack. right they, they are they, they have separate they have they it's have like any other bands. society yeah. where yes you have a yes. leader of the pack so to speak but it's, it's yes. maybe a band of 15 or a dozen horses or yes. 20 horses yes. or whatever it, okay and and um and so i was sitting down with blake mccann in his office and and we started talking about bison after we'd been talking about the horses and and he said to me you know we could have more bison if we didn't have so many horses and and so that has stuck in my mind mm, ever since sure. you know these horses can be seen as competition for other species like bison and the department of the interior has a big big push to try to increase bison numbers and i can understand that and you know everybody likes Everybody likes Everybody buffalo, Everybody loves too. the bison. Yes. Um, Fascinating animals. But, you Unbelievable know, animals. Um, exactly. And, you know, the national mammal. Um, yes. And, um, you know, Senator Hoven, who's been a big supporter of the horses, is also a fan of, of bison and was one of the sponsors to make the bison the national mammal. By the way, actually, that, that brings up an interesting point. Um, so, uh, again, the park has said that they do not view the horses as, as native. And... Um, it's kind of a funny uh, story, though. So there's everybody agrees that horses originated in North America, and they evolved from much smaller precursor species. But, but the horse originated in North America and then migrated probably over the Bering, you know, Bland Bridge, Bridge yeah. into Eurasia. And ironically enough, the, the horses do appear to have died off. Well, first it was thought that they, they went extinct in North, North America based on the fossil record. Uh, around 10,000 years ago, roughly the, the, the end of the last ice age. But a funny thing has happened in the years since. They, they keep finding um, newer uh, bones, and right now the gap is something like 4,000, 5,000 years. Oh. And, and so, yes, as best as we know, it, it sure appears, and I think the scientific cons consensus is that we, we've, we were missing horses for about four or 5,000 years. But here's the funny thing. We all consider the bison, um, our national mammal, to be a native species. Well, except that animal originated in Asia, and it migrated over the Bering Land Bridge um, something like two or 300,000 years ago. So wait a second. Is that really a native species? <laughs> we could have it, you know. It all depends and, how far back in time you want to go. Yeah. Well, and it gets kind of ridiculous because, you know, we've obviously altered, you know, the yes. park does its best job to preserve things. But but once, you know, and humans have been on, on that landscape for, you know, tens of thousands of years, yes. altering it in some way, sometimes using fire as a, you know, a right. tool. So it, it's kind of ridiculous. And um, I mean, uh, this, this idea that a horse, which is also integral to the American West and, and, a, and a symbol of the American West. Um, well, I, and I think that's a big part of it. it is, yes. Is, and I'm not a horse person myself. I, in fact, for some reason, I'm afraid of horses. But but when you talk about a wild horse and the western part of the United States and the Badlands, that is 
that is so American, right? I mean, yes. that, that is so such a symbol. Even for a guy like me who's not into horses, I can see that and go, oh my God. Yes. I mean, that's just... It, I, it, I agree. The, the, the freedom, the wildness, the independence, it all yes. plays into our, you know... They can't be captured. They're yeah. tough to capture. Yes. That, you know, they don't want to be captured. Right. Um, it, it plays into... Our romantic, our, 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 I, I guess. Our, our imagination as Americans of, of how we yeah. view ourselves in some ways. Very, very much so. And, and, and it's a romantic view of the West, right? Absolutely. I mean... These horses have been called the spirit of the Badlands. Yes. And um, and again, they are seen by many as living history, and they their ancestry goes back to both ranch stock and Indian ponies. And so they really embody the the history of the American West. You know, n- they're not just symbols, although they are indeed potent symbols, but they are also vestiges and and they were so important to both American Indian and, mm-hmm. you know, early American settler populations. I mean, the West wouldn't have been uh you know, tamed without the horse. Um, people couldn't have lived without horses uh, in very, very well. Let's touch a little bit on the the public reaction to what the Park Service wanted to do, because you said earlier that you've, in all your years of covering stories and being a journalist, that you've never seen any anything have such unanimity, 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 as people wanting to keep the horses in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. I don't know if we have numbers, like the public comments. Yeah. In one of your stories referred to an unbelievable one-sidedness when it came to people that wanted to keep the horses as opposed to, like, there were four responses of people wanted to get rid of the horses. Yeah. Some crazy thing. It was, I, I forget the specific numbers now, but it was just very overwhelming and, and lopsided. And, and, um, and again, the, the park has done its own visitor surveys. And, and actually, they were caught fudging something here. They, they um, uh, gave a figure of support for the horses that was was just those who, who very strongly supported. But but when you just take all the categories of do you do you support you know do you, do you want horses to be in the park? It was just overwhelmingly in favor. I, I think something in the neighbor of ninety percent or or more, and and yet they tried to pass that off as a small or significantly smaller number. But somebody found the source document and oh. called them out on it, and we wrote about that too. What what and what, what is the well, deal with I, the park service and, I, the, and the horses? I, I, I mean, what? Yeah, I, th- that's the I, that's the central I, question, isn't it? Right. I mean, we don't have, you know, they they've never come out and said, you know, we just don't like the horses because. But one one imagines that they're they're kind of they're they're an expense and and they require some effort. You know, you have to somehow control their population, and. Um, um, I think that maybe they're 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 so high profile. You know, it was actually um, the the predecessor superintendent, a woman named Wendy Ross, who left a couple of well more than a couple of years ago. And during her time, um, they stopped really talking about the horses, and instead they would just post um, responses on a frequently asked questions page and that is the practice today and and that that list sort of evolves you know old questions drop off and you know you just have to check it periodically to see okay is there anything new about the horses and and um i mean they they won't they won't talk to you they won't even talk to a, you know, a journalist and it's just crazy i mean in the old days you could just call up the superintendent or the res- or the chief of interpretation or the resource chief and and talk to them but uh, but that's just not so, been happening so in recent do you, years. do you believe and i know you're not you don't like to be in the opinion business but is it coming from higher up or is it the local managers of the park who are driving this because you know you know the way the federal government works and we're all exactly. we're all employees you and i have bosses well and so um we don't know for sure, but what seems very clear to me is that there is very uh, strong support among the the administrators of the park itself to, to, to get rid of or, or significantly reduce the horse herd, and they seem to have the support of the regional office in Omaha. But it does appear, and I heard from a couple of sources, um, well, uh, Hoven himself has said publicly that, you know, before the announcement was made that we're going to keep the horses, that that there were um, people in Washington, you know, that, that it was not a monolithic view. I think that was the word he used, that there were certainly within the National Park Service influential people who wanted to keep the horses. And I, I actually believe that it was probably the higher-ups in Washington who 
who, you know, when Hoven was sending strong signals that, you know, um, this could affect your budget. Um, and if you want to remove these horses, fine, but Congress is not going to appropriate the money to do it. And keep in mind that um, Hoven has, you know, as a member of the Appropriations Committee, he has been quite a friend of the park. He has gotten, you, your, your listeners might recall that several years ago, there was just a, a, a massive uh, slumping on the Loop Road in the South Unit, and it's been closed ever since. So there's a, a couple of miles or something that have been off limits, and they're re- re- rebuilding it. And it's a major rebuilding job. They, it's not just a resurfacing job. They had to, you know, cut deeper into the hill and, and you know, shore up the base, and and um, they're making some improvements, and I, I think that's going to be ready next year. It will certainly be ready before the, the Theodore Roosevelt Presidential Library opens in 2026, but, but Hoven has been a champion for getting that park what it needs. So, is he's the kind of guy you want to alienate. I, I think that there were some sober minds within the Park Service who said, well, let's not antagonize, you know, a U.S. senator who can do us a lot of favors. So we kind of strayed from the the original question I asked, but the the public pushback was so great in favor of keeping the horses. Did that factor into some of the decisions that were made then to keep the horses at the park? Because you like to think so. I mean, I I do believe so. It comes down to a, a powerful senator, the senior senator from North Dakota, saying, you know, using yes. his leverage and his power, frankly, yes. to make sure this happens. But without um, public input and without public resistance, I think there's no question. I, I think there's there's absolutely no question that the massive public support to keep the horses and the massive public outcry um, against removing the horses in the in the end helped to save the horses. You know, politicians. Um, they, they can a read lot of, numbers pretty that's well. That's <laughs> right. They they know where public opinion is, yes. and this one wasn't you know tough. You wasn't know. even close. Right. So you know, and you know, Governor Burgum, you know, um, because it's been a federal issue, really, Hoven has taken the lead. But you know, you might recall that uh, Governor Burgum said, "Hey, if there's anything the state can do with resources or expertise, uh, again, we, that, we want to help was you a out." Politician reading the numbers and, exactly. and understanding, but Hoven exactly. had the Hoven had the the levers of power. Yes, and made it happen. Happen. And, and you know, I believe that, you know, look, there's a lot of cooperation that goes on between the state and the local governments and the park. You know, this presidential library, which is going to only be good for the park. It's going to bring in, you know, massive numbers, at least in the early years, of new visitors. And, and they will go to the park. And so they're going to have to beef up the infrastructure, the, the transportation, and, and otherwise to accommodate more people. And, and the state is going to be there helping to pay for these improvements. Improvements. And, you know, um, I, I think there's been some talk of, of maybe a partnership of uh, rebuilding a, a Painted Canyon Visitor Center. And and so um, the, the state and, and the Park Service can really work together on a lot of things. And they really shouldn't be at, at loggerheads. And, um, you know... Uh, we have equine uh, programs at both North Dakota State University and Dixon State University, horse experts, you know, who know about horse genetics and how to take care of horses, which, again, honestly, nobody at that park knows anything about horses. Mm. I'm sorry. They, they know they, a wildlife biologist, but, but nobody really knows much about horses. And, and that's a shame because they've got 200 horses and, and they're a huge draw for the park. I mean, I... I don't understand um, why the park doesn't just look at the horses the way everybody else does as just a huge as, asset. As an asset. Yeah, they're a huge draw. There are some people who go specifically to see the horses. Are they easy to see? I've, I've only been well, to Theodore Roosevelt National Park a couple you know, of times. And sometimes I, they are. Sometimes they're not. They're they're kind of fickle. They 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 roam. Now, people who really follow these horses know their favorite hangouts and. Um, well, by the way, there's, that's another issue. Um, there's a, an area called Limbo Flats, and it's in a remote area of the northern fringe of the park, and, and it's really not accessible by any road in the park. You, you get there by gravel roads outside the park, and there's a, a wire fence um, that you can crawl under, and people for years have been crawling under. And... Um, But lo and behold, the park just passed a new regulation in something called its compendium, and um, now it's it's illegal to go under or over a fence. Oh, Um, and you know, uh, Chris. 
Kamen, who's the founder and uh, president of Chasing Horses Wild Horse Advocates based in Dickinson. She's been really the, the, the foremost advocate for these horses and it has been very, very effective in mobilizing public opinion. And um, she runs with her husband a, a little gift store in Medora called Chasing Horses. And, they, you know, so you can buy pictures and T-shirts and knickknacks and that sort of thing. But they also run a, a, a guide service. They'll take people into mm. the park to see the horse. Well, a common way of doing that is, is under this fence near Limbo Flats. And suddenly that's, that's illegal and punishable by six months in jail or like a $5,000 fine. Mm. Oh, except they do grant certain exceptions to some, some groups. There's there's another group called North Dakota Badlands Horse, which years ago has, has been working with the park and helping to place um, removed horses to find them homes and the like. But they've got a key to a, to a gate and can get in there anytime they want. So that's a bit of a... Uh, so um, it's not well known by visitors, but there are some people who, you know, don't have the ability to hike three, four, five miles in rugged terrain, but could, you know, slide under a fence and and walk a couple hundred yards and and get closer to the horses. Um, So that's another battle that's brewing. And and Chris Kamen um, believes that that this is an act of retribution, that they're going after her because she's been a thorn in their side. Sure, sure. So is this it? Is it so uh, the the announcement was April 25th that Senator Hoven said we've reached you know, an understanding or whatever, however you want to phrase it, is it is it over and done with? Are we are we um, going to stop hearing about the horses? I, I would say that the that the advocates would certainly say it is not over, and that um, while you've got these things going on, this um, widespread use of of Gonacon and you know possibly um, sterilizing mares and you know removing young horses without any regard to what you're doing to the to the you know band structures and the you know, the demographics of the herd that you, you can't really feel, you know, confident that these horses are, you know, have a an assured future. Okay. So I think the, the discussions will go on and, and people will continue to keep a close eye on the horses. But the good news is that it is now policy that the horses should should stay. This is a passion of yours, is it not? You, I've uh, noticed with some of the articles you've written for the forum, and, and you can read them all at inforum.com. Just search Patrick Springer in forum in your Google machine. But there's some of the photos of the horses that have, we've used have been taken by you, and you clearly know this subject inside out and sideways and every other way. So this is a, besides being a professional journalist and covering the story, this is a, this is something that matters to you. This is an important thing. It, it does. You know, I'm, I'm a history buff, and I, I see these horses as living history. They're, they're also very beautiful animals. I, I happen to be very interested in, in buffalo as well, and I'm, I'm always happy to see buffalo. But I'm, I must say it's just not the same. You know, people don't have names for, for buffalo in the park, and, <laughs> and they don't have fan clubs. And it's just exciting to see the, the horses. I, I think my, my first visit in that park, I, I, don't, I knew there were, were buffalo, but I didn't know that I, I could see wild horses. And I'm driving along the, the loop road in the south, you know, all of a sudden, wait a second, is that a horse up there on the hill? And and sure enough, here were these wild horses. And, and that's actually one of the things, you know, there are horses in, in the West, wild horses in the West, you know, and um, but they're not as accessible as these horses can can be. If you're lucky, you can just see them from from the road. But, you know, otherwise you can you can hike and see them. And they're much more accessible than they are in most places. But yeah, it's it's just a thrill to see the horses. Thank you, sir. That was fascinating. I that was I've have read your stuff of course, but talking with you about it is is incredible. I mean I it's a an incredible history in the park. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Yep, you bet. Patrick Springer, longtime reporter for the Forum of Fargo-Moorhead and Inforum.com. I would encourage you to go read his stuff on our website. And you could do us all a favor if you would buy a subscription to Inforum.com, and then you could help fund writing and projects and journalism like those that Pat Springer brought to us regarding the wild horses in Theodore Roosevelt National Park. This is the McFeely Mess Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for listening to the McFeely Mess Podcast at Inforum.com. For more podcasts and columns, head to Inforum.com and search Mike McFeely. 